Psalm 96. How great is our God. <clears throat> and by the songs we sang this morning, we kind of figured it out. He's pretty big. He's pretty powerful. Pretty awesome. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. Amen? Amen. I'm glad that he don't stop. I'm glad that he keeps going. I'm glad that he's able to break all the chains that we get bound up with in this world. Everybody here has got a different one. We're not going to look at that today. We're going to look about how great is our God. Psalm 96, verse 1, the Bible says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. <laughs> you know, when you go to the book of Psalms, it's a song book. It's not just by David. There were many writers in there. But David wrote a lot of those psalms. But when you go to the psalms, there's so much that's there that, that we become familiar with, that we associate with. And, you know, if I say Psalm 23, you generally go to a funeral and think, well, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want it. And you go through that process. But if you go to Psalms chapter 89, which we're not going to go to this morning, you will find that the God we know is the God we love. And the God that we worship is the God we love. And so it's also the God that we should serve. Now also, he is a faithful God. You find all of this in these different psalms. And as a result of this, we should be praising his character because it's so faithful. He doesn't change. We should trust his faithful covenant. Listen, we should appreciate his faithful correction. We should await his faithful completion. And so today, at a, I want us to look at a description of God. And there are several details in Psalm 96 that I want to go to. And I love the song, uh, How Great Thou Art. And I started to sing that for you this morning, but I just didn't quite have it. And so I thought I would pass. I took some lozenges and everything, but it just it wouldn't come out right. And so anyway, I just thought I'd pass and just tell you I like that song. And uh, Sarah says, thank you for your <laughs> She's my faithful friend. I like the song, How Great Is Our God. Amen? Amen? You think about these great, wonderful things. But how great thou art. What a song. We come to Psalms 96, and I want to start with a story that I read that I think kind of puts us in the frame of mind. In 1912, there was a medical missionary by the name of Dr. William Leslie. Never heard of him. I heard the story, but I never knew who it was. But I looked him up, and he felt called to this remote area of northern part of the Congo. It was called the Wuhan Village. And after 17 years of being there in that small patch of ground, he came back to the United States, and he was totally discouraged thinking that he was a total failure because he didn't do anything while he was there. He died nine years after he returned to the States, feeling a failure. But in 2010, there was a team from the States that went back to that same place with a missionary by the name of Ramsey. He led that group that went back, and they made a shocking discovery when they arrived. What they found was a network of reproducing churches hidden like a glittering diamonds all over the dense jungle in that area there. So with the help of the missionary aviation group Ramsey and his team, as they landed on the continent, they hiked the, the, uh, a mile into the, uh, to the river, and they got into these dugout uh, canoes, and they got across the big river with that, and then they had to backpack 10 miles into the dense jungle to the place where Dr. Leslie ministered almost a century before. Because Ramsey was thinking, since Dr. Leslie had been in that area, they would have some idea, just some idea of Jesus. He was thinking that they would actually know, not very much, but they would know the name. But what they found, they were unprepared for. <clears throat> Listen to the letter he wrote back. Short part, said when we arrived, we found a network of reproducing churches throughout the jungle. Each village had his own gospel choir. Even though they would not call it a gospel choir, they wrote their own songs and they would have sing-offs from village to village. And he thought he was a failure. Now here's what I want you 
want you to get from that and what I want to say today is that our God is a missionary God. And I want you to get that today, that God is a missionary God. And when I ask for you to give money to a missionary or missionary projects, it's not just to be giving money to somebody that's on the foreign field on vacation. It is somebody there that's trying to plant churches. It's somebody there trying to win people to Christ and build a network of people just like this. That's what it's all about. I think one of the best passages for missions is right here in our text. In verse 3 it says, Declare his glory among the heathens and his wonders among all people. See, the psalm is a major missionary passage. It is a psalm for all creation. Psalm 96 is full of great joy, but also uh, it warns of coming judgment. See, someone said that the psalm was written for worship in the tabernacle. The pre-temple area, and it's, it's found in Chronicles as well in other places, but in fact it was associated with the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant being brought back to Jerusalem under David. It is devoted for praising God for who He is, but also for what He's done. Now, as we go through these verses, we're going to be reminded that our God is a great God. He's a wonderful God. He's a powerful leader. He's a powerful ruler who is coming soon and will bring judgment when he comes. And that's why we should be so fervent and so faithful and so consistent and so continual in our sharing of the truth of the great news, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody we meet. Because we should desire all mankind to stand and praise our great God in that great day. See, our chapter, chapter 96 here, uh, shows us the unavoidable and the undeniable connection between worship and witness. Now keep in mind, and maybe make a note, that there is witness in worship, and there is worship in witness. Now you keep that in mind, okay? One writer by the name of Leopold wrote this passage. He said, the this is the broad prophetic theme that the Lord is coming. That's what he's talking about. Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say, I mentioned this to the men one night on Wednesday night, it says you ought to be living as if Jesus died today and that he was buried, he died yesterday, he's buried today and he's coming back tomorrow. That's the way we ought to live. And guess what? It may not be that long. I mean, we have said he could actually come today. So here in our text in chapter 96, let's get started. First of all, we'll see the jubilation of the saints. See, the psalmist can't help himself in the description of the text. His emotions seem to take over. They seem to be on high alert as he breaks out in a, in a new song. Now watch this in verse 90, chapter 96, verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Now look here for a minute. He's talking about a new song. Did you hear me? A new song. And people go, oh, what a new song. The Bible says we're going to sing a new song. You should be all right with the idea of a new song because every song at one time was new. Amen. Amen. Do you understand that? They all were new. Because see, if you don't understand that and you don't particularly like that, when you get to heaven, the Lord may just break out one for you to learn. <laughs> what are you going to do then? Notice verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless His name. Show forth His salvation from day to day. Now how can we not read this without reminding us of the book of Revelation chapter 5? I mean, and be singing about all the great things that God has done for them. And the passage of Rome, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9 it says, And they sung a new song. Say that with me. New song. New, new song. song. New song. I just wonder if you can say it. New song. New, new song. song. All right. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. Hey, by the way, aren't you glad that it is not just Americans going to be in heaven? Aren't you glad? 
I was thinking about this, and we'll have to say this to you. What if we weren't the ones with the gospel? Yeah. And guess what? We weren't the first ones. What if they just kept it to themselves and never shared it? What if they never sent missionaries to the North, North America continent? And we'd have never heard. What will we be worshiping today? What will we be doing today? I know what, when we die, we go to hell. So I'm glad it's not just Americans around going to be around the throne. I'm glad it's not just going to be white and black people. That it's going to be some red and yellow and all colors around the throne of God. They'll all be there around that throne praising our wonderful God. Aren't you glad that they're not just people around the throne that was able to reach some huge social status in life? If that was the case, I would have never heard the gospel as a 16-year-old boy. It's not because of people's educational status. And aren't you glad that it's all people, all tribes, all kindreds, all nations, as the Bible says here. I mean, who are gathered around God's throne and are praising our great and wonderful God. That's why this message is for all the earth, see. And the only way that we can be there is because that we have bowed our hearts. We have bowed our knees. To our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That is why when we meet together, that we know that this message is not just for us. Listen, you, each one here today, have a responsibility to those around you to share the gospel. You know people I will never, ever talk to. And it's your responsibility because one day you're going to stand before God and answer why you didn't tell those people you say you care about and love about Jesus. I say this because God is going to gather from all people those who have trusted him. See, when Jesus was about to leave after the resurrection, Remember what he said in Matthew 28? He said in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Say all power. All power. There you go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Remember the psalmist said in verse 2, Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. Let me put it to you in our language today where we understand. See, when you fall in love with Jesus, you can't help yourself. Do you understand? When you fall in love with Jesus, you want to tell somebody about it. I mean, you have to tell somebody. In fact, you've got to do that. That Jesus saves, you need to tell that. It's kind of like, a grandmother. You ever watched a grandmother? Grandmother, you say, do you have any grandkids? You know, not, you don't call a grandmother, but you see a lady up in years, and you say, do you have any grandchildren? She said, do I have grandchildren? <clears throat> and she begins to talk to you. And a few minutes later, she pulls out this huge suitcase she's carrying like a purse. And she doesn't have this little album. She has this big family photo thing. And she pulls it out, and she said, well, look at here. Here's some of them in the bathtub, naked. <laughs> And she's so proud. I started to put one I've got a Betty and Jennifer from Rebecca, but I didn't. <laughs> but when you love one so much, you can't help but tell others about the ones you love. What is a missionary? A missionary is someone who has been sent to share a message. So what in the world is the psalmist so excited about? Well, look at verse 10. It says, say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, and the, the world also which be established that it shall not be moved, he shall judge the people righteously. Amen. Now the mission message goes out. So who is invited to hear this message? In verse 1, it's all people. In verse 3, it's all people. It's all the earth in verse 1. It's all people in verse 3. It's, it's the kindreds of the people in verse 7. In verse 9, it's all the earth. In verse 10, it's the heathen. In verse 10, it's the world. Verse 11, it's the earth. Verse 13, is the earth. Verse 13, is the world. The people with all the truth. 
Listen, it is so clear the message is plain. The message is for everybody. It's for all the earth. It's not just for a few chosen people or in somebody in some quality educational group or financial group. It's not that at all. By no means is it that today. The message is so plain that even if you are blind, you can see the meaning of the message. Verse 4 says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. You've heard that before. He is to be feared among all gods. So why is God so great? Well, we see that he is feared above all gods. Again, verse 5 says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You see that? See, there's a little play on words here. It is saying that which is nothing can make nothing. You say, what does that mean? Stay with me. It's like walking. When I was, Sheila and I went to uh, Vancouver years ago when Mike Tester was there. He took us to a park. He said, I just want to show you a place where people come to worship. That was a park. And in that park, there were totem poles. Just like this. And I didn't believe him, but he said, no, I'm serious. They come here and pray to these gods on this totem pole. So it's like walking up to a false god and putting him on a totem pole and saying, can you help me? Now tell me something. How can that help anybody? It can't even make itself. It had to be made. It had to be put together. How about walking up to a god that's carved out of a rock and saying, can you help me? It's like walking up to a god made of gold or silver and saying, can you help me? They could not even make themselves. How in the world can they help anybody else? Now you can see what the psalmist is saying here. It is saying that which is nothing can make or do nothing. That's what he's saying. For all the gods of the nation are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. See? The psalmist said that the God who really lives is the very one that made the heavens and made the earth. See, the architect of the universe shows us that there is a creator. See, the stars in the heaven, the rain that falls on the ground here in Putnam County, the flash of lightning and the thunder is a reminder that God is really there in heaven. Amen. And when you see a watch, that thing on your wrist. You see that watch. You know there's a watchmaker somewhere. Amen. Yeah. I mean, it just didn't come fall together by itself. When you look at this piano, listen, you know there's a piano maker somewhere. Mm -hmm. Amen. Is there any wonder why the psalmist breaks out in a song of praise and splendor and wonder and power and majesty of our great God because he is a way maker where there is no way. Verse 6 says, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. But let me ask you a question. We'll be done in a few minutes, but has God given you a new song? Has God given you a new song? Is there a song about his beauty and majesty and grace that's just bubbling up inside of you? If it's not, it should be. There should be a new song in your heart. See, when you come to the point and the place in your life that you realize that you're without Jesus Christ, that you're just sort of an empty shell, you're useless. So when you come to the place in your life without Jesus that you're dead and you're pointless, See, God's Holy Spirit shows you the greatest need in your life, and that is Jesus Christ. And that is to quit focusing on life, your own needs, your own wants, your own cares, and turn to Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Savior. Amen. Amen. Invite Jesus to come in and to take control of your life. That is when He puts a new song in your heart. Psalmist. 
First, there's jubilation in saints. And then, secondly, there's an invitation to the nations. The psalm is a summons of, all, of an invitation of the people of the nations of the earth to come and to worship. Look at verse 7. Give unto the Lord, O ye, o ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Now, we should give glory, give God glory, and, and that he should alone, that he, that he alone deserve. We should do that. But the psalmist doesn't stop there as if he, he just keeps on singing. He, he gets beyond that point and goes to another point. I know sometimes I wish there was some way that you could see yourself singing. <laughs> like these people that stand up here see you singing. <laughs> you know, just kind of like mouthing the words, looking up at the screen. I don't like that song. That don't make no sense. Listen, don't act like that. I just wish there was somebody who said, see, when somebody is worshiping, listen, listen, you're not to be stoic. Listen, you ought to be able to have some emotion in that song. You ought to put your heart into it. You say, well, I don't know that song. Well, learn that song and then get with it. Amen? Amen. And uh, smile while you sing. <clears throat> smile while you worship the Lord. See, the psalmist is so caught up in his worship and he just keeps singing. Look at verse 8. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. Oh my goodness, let me stop. <laughs> Bring an offering and come into his courts. See, because of who God is and because of what he's done. See, we owe God our lives. We owe God our love. In fact, we owe God everything. There's no wonder that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, uh, your bodies, a, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We are walking specks of dust. And we have a debt that we cannot pay. And Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. And with great grace comes great responsibility. So remember, you cannot earn it. You cannot win it. And you cannot somehow purchase it. You can only receive it because it's free. It's a free gift from God. But after you get God's free and glorious gift of eternal life, let me tell you what should be natural about you, that you would glorify the majestic name of God. That you wouldn't just say, well, I'm a Christian, I ain't telling nobody. Listen, you should be vibrant about it. it should, that new song in your heart. Listen, tell me something. Have you not heard a song and the next thing you know you're singing it all the time? Mm -hmm. it didn't take much. I mean, something, if a catchy tune comes, listen, if you read your Bible, that'll be a catchy tune. You'll find something that you like. But you've got to take time to read it. You've got to spend time in it. So, we should naturally want to glorify his majestic name by the way that we live and the words that we use. See, Paul would speak of this debt again and our responsibility because we are a debtor. Listen to Romans 1 verse 14. It says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Barbarians. Do you know who that is? That's us. We're barbarians. You know, oh, no, we're not. We don't do. Yeah, we do. We're barbarians. Both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the rest of us, the Greeks. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Now here I want you to pay close attention. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That is why the psalmist went on to say in verse 9, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Now that word worship, that's a good word. 
And we all know what it means, so I don't need to explain it, but let me just tell you what it means, in case you don't know. The word worship actually means one that prostrates, and prostrate, prostrates himself out on the ground before God, Amen. face down, before all the earth. See, what the psalmist is saying here is that when one comes before our God, acknowledging who he is, acknowledging what he's done, and as you worship and you tremble before him, you demonstrate a humble spirit as you bow before him. Amen. I mean, no matter who people think that they are down here on earth, let me just tell you something, and don't be surprised here, but no one is going to strut into the presence of God. Amen. No one. I think I have a picture. There you go. <laughs> He's struggling. Nobody's going to strut into the presence of God. And I mean nobody. Nobody's going to stand before God and say how great I am. It'll always be how great thou art. Yes. Amen. So my question is, have you humbled yourself before your God today? Have you repented of your sins? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Is your answer no to those questions? You better do it before it's too late. Better do it. Listen, the Bible teaches us that you will either stand before him as now or you will stand before him as a judge later. Now listen to what he said in verse 10. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. O. C. S. Lewis observed the psalmist on God's judgment as an opportunity for rejoicing and that the people are glad when he administers it. Back over in Psalm 67, the writer said in verse 4, O oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. What does Selah mean? See there, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So look at that. O oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. What do you think about that? Now think just for a moment. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. The word govern here can mean that we think or as a, to judge, to rule. It's the idea here in our psalm that one day our great God is going to rule over the nations of the world. And when that takes place, he will do so with righteousness. Let me tell you something. Well, this is what you find in the book of Revelation anyway. But Jesus is coming back as the king of kings one day. Amen? Amen. And the Lord of lords and to rule and to reign forever and ever. But here's my question. As we reach our final fall, are we ready for his return? Amen. Are you ready for his return? Amen. Do you welcome his return? Listen, if Jesus was to show up right now, would you be excited or would you be terrified? Which is it? You're going to be one or the other. See, there's what we call the jubilation of the saints. And there's the invitation of the nations. And I added this one just last, well, lately. And it, after the fact sermon was done, I put this in to close with. And there's an emancipation of creation. Look at verse 11. I didn't want to leave these verses out. So I didn't want you to go home and say, well, he should have preached the rest of it. I'm going to, since you asked. Now, it says, Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that in there, excuse me, that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. <laughs> the psalmist is talking about all creation is called to be a great chorus of worship. To the creator, to the Lord of creation, over the seas, over the forest. Listen, I mean, can't you hear them singing? Can't you hear them rejoicing together? 
This is a powerful picture of all creation worshiping together, praising our great and wonderful God. Even the waves that beat upon the shore are praising God. And the winds that rustle through the leaves of our trees, listen, they're praising God. And why? Verse 13. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with the truth. Now this word righteousness means things that are right. Okay? Things that are right. Now let me tell you, there is a, a lot around here that we're seeing today that's not right. Amen. We're living in a not right place. See, there's a whole lot of things that are taking place that are not just. See, our world is filled with vice and with sin and with hatred, with ungodliness. Our world is filled with anger and anguish. So there is coming a day. We say this again. There's coming a day soon, soon, when Jesus will return. And when he comes back, he is going to put everything right. Yeah. Man, he's going to put everything right. Donald Garvin may just be the father of missionology, study of missions. He was born in the late 1800s and he lived all the way to 1990. He was the dean of the School of World Missions at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. He started his missionary work in India in 1937. He wrote this booklet called The Founders of the India Church. And in that booklet, he tells a story, he uses it as an illustration. He said there was a man that lived in the area of Punjab, India. His name was Diet. Diet is what you would call today an untouchable. He was sort of a dark-skinned lame man. He labored in the local streets selling skins and of animals for his living. He was well respected by the lower caste of society in his day. And then one day he heard about Jesus. He heard about this Jesus who was a good man who went about doing good. And how that he went to a cross and he died so that men might obtain salvation. Did said, I'd like to know that kind of God. Did gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And there was another Christian in a village who had came alongside of him and began to teach him things of the Bible. He taught him the Ten Commandments. He taught him the Lord's Prayer. He taught him the 23rd Psalm. He taught him John 3.16. And he began to grow in his newfound faith. And as he grew, he desired, because of what he was studying, to be baptized. And so there was no preacher there. So he walked 25 miles to a mission outside of his town to a missionary. And the missionary told him that he ought to uh, stay there with them in that mission and work there. He said, because if you go back to your home, you're going to be an outcast. No one is going to want to have anything to do with you because of your faith in Christ. You will lose your family, your job. No matter how meager that might be, you'll lose it. He said, but I have my family there. My wife is there. Missionary said, well, go get your wife and bring her here and I'll baptize you. Diet said, no. God didn't save me to take me out of my community. He saved me to go back into my community. Amen. So the missionary baptized him and he went back to his community. And immediately, as the missionary said, his family disowned him. His wife quit cooking for him. That'll get your attention. <laughs> the landlord was giving him a hard time no one would loan him any money no one would buy stuff from him but you know what he stayed faithful he stayed faithful and by the way that he lived and he worked and yes the words that he shared to make a very long story short it wasn't long before he led his wife to the Lord Amen. and several of his family members to the Lord and they all walked back 25 miles to the missionary and were baptized. And then they all returned to the village where they were from and share, was sharing about Jesus to those in the village. 
And they began to tell all those in that caste society which they were in that Jesus could and would save them in their village. Dean said that Jesus would even save women which were lower than dogs in that society. And then the missionary came to their village and many more got saved. It was about 11 years after Diet was saved and baptized that there were over 500 people had gotten saved. Amen. Amen. And within a matter of a few years, every one in that lower caste in Diet's district was one to Christ. You say, how many? Well, they say that he had a neighborhood of about 450,000. The other districts around there started hearing about what was going on. And they got in it as well. And the word got out that the village of Punjab to other places. And all of this happened because of one man. And you get this. One man heard the gospel. He trusted Jesus Christ. And then he started telling others. Amen. He started telling others. And hundreds of thousands of people came to faith in Christ. Now let me remind you that our God is a missionary God. <coughs> he really is. See, our God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus into the world to die for your sins and my sins. So that we might be saved. And not just that, but that we would tell others how we got saved. And one day soon, I believe that same Jesus is coming back. Amen. Amen. So if he was to come back right now, my question for you today as a church, are you ready? Are you ready? If you were to hear Jesus is coming, would you be excited? Would you be expectant? Or would your heart be filled with fear? See, you don't have to be afraid if you're ready for his coming. You can be excited. You can be ready before you leave the service today. What I want to do is just to tell you this, that if you're not ready, if you're not saved, please, come, excuse me, come and let us talk to you about that. Let us take the gospel and show you how to be saved. But if you're saved today and you're not ready, Hey, all I can tell you is you need to get ready. Amen. You need Amen. to get to an altar and confess to God, not to the preacher, but to God, that you need help. You need strength. You need something to get you through every day. Because let me just tell you something. He's going to surprise you and show up. Yeah. We were at a funeral this week. She was uncle passed away. And there's a, <laughs> one of her cousins husbands, and he tells us all the time, he said, hey, when you go come see you? I said, I come every funeral. <laughs> and I said, and by the way, you never come see me. And he said, Roger said, well, he said, we're going to come. I said, when? He said, when I get an invite. I said, you've had one. I tell you all the time, every time I see you, come see us. Come see us. And I, and I don't just say that. I mean it. You come see us. And he said, well, one day, I don't believe it, but anyway, I will tell you this, one day, 